Having completed all their pre-launch tests, including the wet dress rehearsal, Starship 25 and Super Heavy Booster 9, are now ready for the second integrated flight test. On October 31, the Federal Aviation Administration announced that it has wrapped up its Starship safety review, which assesses the risks a launch might pose to public health and property. The FAA, when it closed the mishap investigation into the first integrated flight test, identified 63 corrective actions for SpaceX, of which 27 were related to public safety. The completion of the safety review does not mean the FAA is ready to update the Starship launch license and approve another launch to proceed. The agency is continuing to work on an environmental review, including consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, regarding any environmental effects of the new water deluge system that SpaceX installed beneath the orbital launch mount after the April test flight. In an October 26 statement, the Fish and Wildlife Service said it had formally reinitiated consultation with the FAA about modifications to the pad and that they have up to 135 days to issue an amended biological opinion. However, the agency does not expect to take the full amount of time for the review. During the past three weeks, Fish and Wildlife Service officials were spotted surveying the area surrounding the Starbase launch site as part of the environmental review procedure. They mainly concentrated on the area surrounding the launch pad where the deluge system's water is released. The environmental review is the last major element to be completed before the FAA makes a license determination. On November 3, SpaceX updated its website to announce that the Starship's second integrated flight test could launch as soon as mid-November, pending regulatory approval. Sources suggest the launch could be as soon as November 13. An official announcement will only be made after the FAA issues the launch license. The flight profile for the upcoming flight test is mostly similar to the first test flight in April. After lifting off from the launch pad, the Starship launch vehicle will fly eastward from Starbase over the Gulf of Mexico. The rocket will surpass the speed of sound and maximum aerodynamic pressure in less than a minute. The launch vehicle will endure the harshest structural loads of its ascent into space during Max-Q. The booster stage will separate approximately 161 seconds into the flight and will perform a boost backburn and attempt a soft water landing in the Gulf of Mexico, about 30 kilometers from the shore. After stage separation, Orbital Starship will continue flying between the Florida Straits, nearly reaching orbital velocity, before splashing down at the targeted location approximately 100 kilometers off the northwest coast of Kauai. The splashdown is scheduled to occur 90 minutes after liftoff from Starbase. SpaceX has made multiple modifications to the upcoming mission compared to the previous flight test to avoid catastrophic failures. The second flight test will debut the new hot stage separation technique. It involves igniting the engines on the Starship's upper stage just before stage separation, while still attached to its booster stage. This method will reduce gravity loss during flight and solve issues such as settling fuels in the upper stage. It will also increase the Starship's payload to orbit by 10%, as thrusting will not be paused during flight. During the upcoming test flight, the booster engines will be electrically steered instead of using a complex web of plumbing and hydraulic power units. Previously, if the hydraulic power units failed, it would affect the gimbaling ability of all the booster engines. The new electric thrust vector control system, integrated with each one of the inner 13 gimbaling engines of the booster, makes those engines independent. This means that even if one of the engines fails, the gimbaling of the rest of the engines would be unaffected. The electric thrust vector control system eliminates the need for hydraulic power units and reduces the number of plumbing, saving over a ton of hydraulic mass on the launch vehicle. Apart from the launch vehicle, the launch pad also received many upgrades after the first flight. Reinforcements to the pad foundation and a water-cooled steel flame deflector are among many other enhancements. Also, as you can see, compared to the first test flight, the timing of various mission profile milestones differs in the second flight. It's highly unlikely that the Starship will achieve all its milestones during the upcoming test flight. But as SpaceX mentions, excitement is guaranteed. Starship 25 and Booster 9 are currently undergoing final round of preparations ahead of the integrated flight test. Ship 25 was destacked from Booster 9 on November 2 for the installation of the flight termination system. It is a safety mechanism designed to destroy the rocket in flight by triggering an explosion to ensure public safety if the launch vehicle goes out of control or off course during its flight. Flight termination system charges will be installed on both the ship and the booster a day or two prior to launch. Starship 26, which completed a single-engine static fire test last month, returned to the production site on October 27. The ship is currently stationed at the Rocket Garden. Ship 28 is currently being prepared for static fire tests near the Rocket Garden.
it is currently unclear whether Ship 26 or Ship 28 will be launched after the test flight of Ship 25. Ship 29, which had completed its cryogenic proof test campaign, is also getting ready for static fire tests at the Rocket Garden. Ships 30 and 31 are being prepared for cryoproof tests inside the high bay, and Ship 32 stacking operations are happening next to them. The oxygen tank section of Ship 32 was moved into the high bay last Thursday afternoon, and it was joined with the already stacked sections a few hours later. Ship 32's basic structure will be complete once the aft section joins the section stacked inside the high bay. Booster 11, which had completed two cryoproof tests last month, is at the Massey's test site. Fully stacked boosters 10 and 12 are inside the Mega Bay, and Booster 13 stacking operations are progressing beside them. The second Raptor installation stand was moved into the Mega Bay on October 28. The test stand and its lifting platform will make booster engine installation easier and quicker. The first engine installation stand was moved into the Mega Bay in August, and a third stand is currently being built at the Sanchez site. Once all three stands are operational, SpaceX can work on three boosters at a time inside the Mega Bay. Apart from the three engine installation stands, two more booster stands are being built at the Sanchez site. They are basically mini versions of the orbital launch mount, with booster hold-down clamps and 20 Raptor quick disconnect mechanisms. It is believed they are parts of future booster test stands that will support static fire tests. Please check out my previous video to learn more about these two stands. Link in the description. At Massey's, after removing the aft section of Starship 27 from the structural test cage, teams placed test tank ship 24.2 in the same cage for testing. The cage, with pistons installed, is designed to simulate the stresses a Starship will experience during various stages of a flight. The test results will aid SpaceX in redesigning and upgrading future Starship prototypes. Recently, in an interview with Space Flight Now, NASA's Human Landing System Program Manager, Dr. Lisa Watson Morgan, shared updates on the Starship Lunar Landing System. Dr. Morgan revealed that NASA prefers to see 15 to 17 Starship launches prior to the Artemis III lunar landing mission, which will be the first crewed flight of the Starship to the lunar surface. She added that SpaceX and the Human Landing System team recently achieved some development milestones needed to support the Starship lunar lander. They recently completed a cold start Raptor vacuum test to test if the engine can be started in the extreme cold conditions resulting from extended time in space. A ground demonstration of the spacecraft docking was performed at NASA last week, as Starship will first have to be able to dock with the Orion spacecraft and Lunar Gateway during Artemis missions. The team is also working on smaller thrusters required for trajectory correction maneuvers and lunar landing maneuvers. Work on crew life support systems and other spacecraft components within the crew cabin is also progressing at various NASA facilities. SpaceX has a mock-up of a Starship lunar landing system nose cone at Starbase. The nose cone prototype consists of an elliptical stainless steel dome, or E-dome, and a crew cabin floor inside. The exact purpose of this prototype is still unknown. Please check out my previous video to learn about this nose cone structure in detail. Link in the description. New renders of Starship Human Landing System have been leaked on the internet lately, although their authenticity is not fully confirmed yet. The previous design released officially by SpaceX showed a sleek white rocket with integrated solar panels at the top. The new design offers a much more refined design with four main changes. The first is the solar panels now being deployed from payload bays at the top of the rocket. SpaceX has also redesigned the thrusters that will help maneuver the lander for a precise lunar touchdown. The aft section of the ship in the new design is black, perhaps for shielding from lunar regolith. The landing leg design has also changed in the latest design. While we are unsure if the leaked designs are real renders from SpaceX, they are of the same style and quality as the previously released official renders. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. A Chinese commercial spaceflight company, iSpace, has successfully launched and safely landed a test article on its path to developing a reusable launch vehicle. On November 2, iSpace launched its Hyperbola 2Y single-stage test vehicle from a test site at the Jiaquin Satellite Launch Center. During its 51-second flight, the prototype climbed to a height of 178 meters and then made a powered descent and soft landing, supported by four landing legs. The 3.35-meter diameter, 17-meter long Hyperbola 2 test stage is powered by a Focus 1 engine that runs on liquid methane and liquid oxygen propellants. The flight test verified the engine's variable thrust propulsion, as well as the test vehicle's vertical landing guidance, navigation, and control systems. 
The test is comparable to the Grasshopper test SpaceX conducted in 2011 and 2012 as part of their effort to reuse the Falcon 9 first stage. The successful hop test marks major progress towards iSpace's aim to develop the Hyperbola 3 rocket with a reusable first stage by 2025. The 69-meter-long rocket will be able to lift 8.5 tons to low Earth orbit in reusable mode. For comparison, the Falcon 9 can lift 17.4 tons in a reusable configuration. iSpace says it aims to conduct 25 Hyperbola 3 launches per year by 2030. The company also plans to develop Hyperbola 3B, a triple-core version of the Hyperbola rocket, similar to SpaceX's Falcon Heavy in configuration. Hyperbola 3B will be capable of carrying no less than 15 tons into low Earth orbit. Blue Origin has unveiled a mock-up of the cargo version of its Blue Moon Lunar Lander, which the company plans to use to test and refine features for its much larger human lander. NASA selected the Blue Origin-led national team as part of its human landing system program in May, joining SpaceX's Starship for the agency's Artemis missions to the moon. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson recently shared pictures of the Blue Moon Mark I lunar lander design during a tour of a Blue Origin facility in Alabama. Dubbed Pathfinder, the lander design is leaner and taller compared to the earlier lander version the company has shown off. The inaugural Pathfinder mission is planned to serve as a demonstrator to evaluate critical systems within the lunar lander. Apart from delivering up to three tons of cargo to the lunar surface, the mission will also demonstrate technologies, including the BE-7 engine, communications, cryogenic power and propulsion systems, and landing accuracy to within 100 meters. All of which will be required for the NASA Human Landing System for the Artemis program. If all goes according to plan, starting with the Artemis 5 mission, the Blue Moon Mark II lander will carry up to four astronauts to the lunar surface for up to 30 days. There are also plans for a cargo variant of the Mark II lander, which will be able to carry up to 20 tons of cargo in a reusable configuration and 30 tons in a one-way journey to the moon. Blue Origin is developing the reusable New Glenn rocket to launch its Blue Moon landers. The New Glenn rocket has yet to make its first flight, having suffered years of delays and redesigns. At present, Blue Origin hoped to get the vehicle off the pad sometime in 2024. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.